I'm Bob Dickey, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Leap Podcast. My guest today is Jeff Wayne. Jeff is the president and CEO of Max ERC Refund. He is also the owner of multiple cycle bar franchises and is the former president and CEO of Dynamic Rehabilitation. He's a graduate of Michigan State University and is a member of the Young Presidents Organization, also known as YPO. Jeff and I have been close friends for many years, and our adventures have included mountain climbing in Colorado and even climbing Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, Africa. Jeff is a serial entrepreneur and comes from an incredible entrepreneurial family. I know his origin story, and I can't wait for you to hear what he has to share. So let's jump right in. Well, Jeff, it's been a, a long time since you and I have had an opportunity to sit down and have a long format conversation. I've been looking forward to having you on the podcast for quite some time. So thank you for taking the uh, the time this afternoon to be with us. I'm really excited. I really uh, am glad that you asked. And it seems like when you and I get together, uh, great things happen. So let's see where this goes today. Well, I, I am sure there's going to be some uh, phenomenal content and insight. I tell you what, you're probably one of my favorite mountain climbing buddies. So we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this. But you know, you are a uh, have a wealth of knowledge, and you are a great conversationalist. Mm -hmm. And I can recall whether we were climbing 14ers in Colorado, or we were uh, on an epic trip in Africa, climbing Kili, and then out in the Serengeti uh, on a safari. Yeah, uh, you were a person that I loved standing next to or hiking next to because you were just, you know, full of wisdom and uh, always engaging conversation. We've talked about so many things. I think we've solved a lot of the world's problems when we were on Chile. <laughs> So. Well, I'll tell you what, those are some of the best memories that I have in life. And, you know, I've got to be honest with you, the very first big mountain I ever did was with you and uh, in my college roommate, Gary Minerich. And I'll tell you what, I needed both of you to get to the top. And so that was the beginning of a lot of epic journeys that uh, that we've done over 14,000 feet. And uh, I'm still doing them. Just did the very first one with my 19 year old son. Uh, a few months ago, and it was a, a great learning experience for him, and it was a great learning experience for me because I got some insight as to what kind of man he's going to grow up to be. Well, let's start there. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about it. I re I remember the time then you and I uh, started at O Dark Thirty in the middle of the night to climb Pikes Peak, and you know the the excitement that we had pent up. We have our he headlamps on. We we had trained and we had everything dialed in, but you're um, you you there's always these unexpected things that come up, you know, on a climb, you can't prepare for everything, but what you got to be prepared for is that you got to have that long gear. You got to have grit. And, you know, you and I encouraged each other on in multiple climbs and uh, tell me a little bit about what you learned with your son and how you were able to coach him and see uh, what you saw in him come out. Cause th those climbs are always great learning experiences, right? So many life lessons can be taught in those, in those moments. They are, and probably more so than anything, they give you a lot of confidence for future climbs. And I, I really felt like when I did my very first climb uh, ever, it was literally because my that college roommate, Gary Minerich, uh, just kind of got the itch to do a first climb. And he threw out the idea one summer of doing Mount Everest Base Camp. Now, Base Camp is a challenge, but that's kind of where the real climbers begin. And that's where we were going to end. Mm -hmm. And at first I told him he was crazy and I really wasn't interested, but I've had a, uh, a 35 year relationship with that guy. And I knew that if I didn't go, that I was kind of killing his dream of, of climbing this. And so after uh, some talking into, I agreed to do it. And then a little while later, I think he came to his senses and said, you know, we should probably climb something prior to just jumping into Evers base camp being the very first thing we've ever climbed. And so the idea of Pike's Peak came up. I think Gary in a past life had lived in Colorado, so he was familiar with it. And it's a, uh, it's a mountain just over 14,000 feet. That is uh, typically a one, a one day climb. And so I didn't have any idea what I was getting myself into. And I trained a little bit. I was actually about at the heaviest point in my life. I'm, I'm a five foot nine guy that was a former athlete, but I was creeping up on 180 pounds. And, and so I, I did a little work on the elliptical. I, in hindsight, I didn't do anywhere close to the amount of um, uh, the regiment that I should have been doing. And, and I probably lost six or seven pounds and thought, hey, I'm good. 
Well, I was in for quite a surprise when I got to altitude. Altitude climbing is significantly different than walking around my relatively flat state of Michigan. And so I kind of learned the hard way uh, that you've got to be prepared for anything in life, especially mountain climbing. Right. And so through uh, through your encouragement and and some pushing uh, from Gary, I not only uh, summited Pikes Peak, and I was extremely thrilled about that. It was brutal. I mean, I wasn't feeling well all the way up. I I wanted to stop, and if I didn't have you two there, uh, I would not have finished. And so, if we fast forward a little bit to a few months ago, and and I've got about uh, about a dozen mountains in between there. I'm I'm into what I thought was going to be a nine or ten hour climb with my son, and of course, those uh, guys out there, or women out there with nineteen year old sons, they think they can do anything with mm -hmm. no training whatsoever. And yeah. and so he was at the gym a little bit. Maybe he did a little extra cardio instead of just lifting like he normally does. And we uh, we start at at uh, 0400 hours uh, in the dark at the trailhead of Pikes Peak. And he uh, he's ripped Brandon ready to go. And he thinks, uh, I, you know, I had asked him a few times prior to the trip, are you ready? Are you ready? What have you done? And he's like, Dad, I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about you. Mm -hmm. I've been on and the stair so, stepper at the country club. I got this yes. dialed in. Yep. And so so we begin and we're we're prepared. I mean, and, and again, we're back to that preparedness that that I learned initially from you and from Gary of having enough water and having enough layers and and uh, things of that nature. And so literally, Bob, one hour into the hike, you know, we're both huffing and puffing because that that in a lot of ways is the most difficult hour as your body uh, is acclimating and, and adjusting to the to the situation. He stops and he looks at me. We've got our headlamps on. He says, Dad, I don't think I can do this. And of course, I'm thinking in my mind, we've got another eight or nine hours of this. Right. And so I said, well, let's break this down. What's the problem? He said, I'm just, I'm cramping. I feel like I'm going to throw up. And I'm like, well, then throw up. And he didn't need to be asked twice. And uh, that helped a lot. And, you know, it just, uh, it really showed me that he could gut it out. And uh, nine hours later, we we're standing on the summit together. And he was... Uh, he was beside himself at at uh, the happiness that it brings, and yeah. and the fact that if you just set your mind to something, you know it can be done. And I was fortunate enough a, a few years prior to that to have a similar experience with my daughter Madison. Uh, and so both my kids I've taken to their their first summit, and then both of them were Pikes Peak in Colorado. Oh, and again, it was uh, it was really because of you and Gary. Well, I'll tell you the, the the journeys that we've had. You know, we've we've climbed together, we've climbed with friends. I've taken multiple corporate groups up on Pikes Peak. I, I've called it the Pikes Peak Challenge, and uh, my son Lachlan climbed it when he was 14. So I, you know, teasing me, did his first 14 or at 14. Uh, I'm looking forward to taking some of my other kids back. But it, I have always thought that it is a, it's a very cathartic and spiritual experience when you're on the side of a mountain, you're climbing, you're away from you know, the noise of life, the cell signals, you're, you're with people that you care about, you're talking, uh, you're going through extremely difficult moments. Everybody has their moment and sometimes you have multiple. And the only way you get through it is having someone that's encouraging you there. You learn a lot about yourself. Um, there's so many leadership lessons on the side of those mountains. But the thing that I always appreciate is I have not seen somebody make a summit where they are not emotional and where they, they, they look back down and they remember, you know, the many steps, all the hours, all the hard work, and they're looking down at the base of that mountain when they're standing on the summit. And it's just like this emotional experience is something that they've accomplished. And I think it, it burns that into your psyche um, that no matter, you know, you're going to have all sorts of obstacles and things like that, that you have to go through in life, but you just say, Hey, it's one step in front of the other one day at a time. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've learned and how you've taught people about the long gear, but you've got to have that long gear on a mountain and you've got to have that long gear, uh, in life. And, but I just, I relish the, the, that, that spiritual experience and that, uh, emotional experience when someone makes the summit. I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Bob. I have seen, 
uh, guys that are built like tree trunks and climbing with other guys that are 30, 40 pounds overweight and don't look like climbers at all. And I'm the, I'll be the first one to tell you that in my mind, climbing is 70% mental and 30% physical. Yes, you have to be in shape. Yes, you have to prepare. You have to log a lot of hours and a lot of days before a big climb. But if you don't think you're going to make it to the top, you're not going to make it to the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've just I've seen some really well built humans that you would think could conquer Everest, and they don't make it halfway to the top, and they're they're just out of the game because they thought all they had to do was to show up and. I will say one one uh, one memory I have of you and and uh, and your perseverance was for whatever reason you decided not to take Diamox, a drug that we take to help process low levels of oxygen mm -hmm. at high altitude, and you decided not to do Diamox on Kilimanjaro, and you summited, but you were in a world of pain, and I remember you told me that it felt like your brain was crashing on each side of your skull mm -hmm. with every step. And uh, so I, I, I really, that was one of the turning points with me where um, I have no problem taking a, a climb, helping a drug like Diamox on my high climbs, because uh, I don't need to prove anything else. I'm not sure what your opinion is on that, but I remember that vividly that you were in agony. I was, it was the most severe pain I've ever been in my life. And, you know, I'm a, an athlete like you, I've run marathons, I've been in the military, I've done some crazy things and, but literally the most pain I've ever been in my life was at the summit of Kilimanjaro. I got massive altitude sickness. It was a, it was a little bit disappointing because I was kind of trying to gut through all that. And my, I think my experience on the summit was a little bit diminished just because of the amount of pain I was in, but it was also the most painful day of my life because, um, you know, it took us an entire day to get down off the summit, back down into that, that base camp in every step of the way I was in excruciating pain. Uh, I'll never forget it. So if I were to ever go back and do that, which I want to do with some of my kids, I will definitely take, um, you know, some, some, um, pharmacopoeia to help me kind of cope with altitude sickness. Uh, but you know, it, it also, that, that, re, uh, experience reminds me that, um, you know, you, no matter what you want to do in life, it's just one step at a time, uh, one foot in front of the other, you'll get through it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> thank you for reminding me of that pain. On that subject of preparedness, I would like to just uh, point out that I didn't know what being prepared was prior to my first climb. And that's why it was so important for me to go with you and for Gary and I to learn along the way as to how you prepare and what you have to bring and that sort of thing. Because I had nothing left in the tank on my first drive when I got to the top of Pikes Peak. I mean, it was a miserable, miserable day and uh, anything that could go wrong went wrong. But then I knew what it took to climb at altitude. Mm -hmm. And so about six or eight months later, uh, I got talked into climbing Kilimanjaro by Gary. Mm -hmm. And man, did I get into work mode. I lost a ton of weight. I, I logged uh, 335 miles on my elliptical in three months. Uh, I wasn't in a, in a healthy way. I wasn't finishing meals. I was, I, was, I probably lost too much weight. I went from about almost 180 pounds to about 150 pounds. But, you know, climbers have a, have a, uh, a slogan that says ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain, mm -hmm. which that basically means is the more weight you have to carry up a mountain, the worse it is. So you don't want to carry any weight that you don't have to. But then there are some necessities like food, water, and clothing that you don't want to be short on. But one thing you can control is your own body weight. And so if you're 10 pounds overweight or 20 pounds overweight, imagine carrying that miles into the atmosphere uh, after days of climbing, it it all takes its toll. And um, to that end, when when Gary and I got to the summit of Kilimanjaro about uh, six or eight months after Pikes Peak, we uh, were not exhausted. We felt like we had another 2,000 feet left in us, mm -hmm. and yet Kilimanjaro is about a mile higher than Pikes Peak was. And so I was I was just very, very prepared, and it was such a sense of accomplishment because I knew what it was going to be like. I knew where I needed to get my body, and more important, I knew where my head needed to be, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, the trip of a lifetime.
Let's talk about the the timing of that trip for all of us. There was a group of us that went, and it felt like uh, each one of us was at a inflection point in our life, in our career, doing a little bit of soul searching. Um, what what have you found uh, about climbing, going on a big adventure like this, or climbing, or taking on a really tough physical pursuit? Uh, in various times in your career that's helped you either as a as a businessman as a leader we'll, we'll definitely get into this in a little bit but you come from a a very storied history of entrepreneurs in your family you yourself are an entrepreneur you're developing your children to be i want, I want to um, learn more about the, uh, those stories but you know tell me how this impacted you as a leader and what you brought back to you know your businesses and to your life and how maybe it impacted you I think a couple things stand out. Maybe maybe number one is just uh, not giving up. Uh, you might recall that a, a dear friend of mine uh, lost their seven year old son in a skiing accident, and and I chose to bring a banner to mm -hmm. the top of Kilimanjaro uh, in memory of him. And his family uh, had a had a, just a family motto to this day. I still see them post about it. It just says never give up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one thing if you get hurt on a mountain, um, you know, severe blisters, severe medical problems, um, disorientation, things like that, you should turn around and not and 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 uh, and be safe. Mm -hmm. But there's a there's a difference between quitting and and uh, and getting injured or something mm -hmm. that is right. going to risk to your health. And that's why that's why I'm a, such a firm believer that that climbing is such an awesome sport because it's so much in your head. And mm. if you think you can make it, then you're practically there. And so I try to instill that in my kids. I try to get them to uh, to try things that they haven't done. And, and most importantly, to not give up. Uh, my my family has incorporated 23 companies in the last 40 years. And uh, we pretty much learned it from my mom and dad. My, mm -hmm. my, uh, my dad had uh, businesses growing up and my mom had a wig business uh, back in her early twenties. Uh, my parents were married at 18, three kids by the age of 23, and they actually celebrate their 59th wedding anniversary tomorrow. So oh, wow, that's um, amazing. Yes. And um, so one of the, one of the big companies in my family background, my dad started a a company called Duracon, and um, he invented a product called the Duraliner, which was a bed liner for truck beds, mm -hmm. and started that business about in 1980. And had he had a sales background, he was a, a top salesperson for IBM for 10 years, and did a lot of their training and programs and things of that nature. And uh, so, uh, long story as to how he got into the bed liner business, but he did in 1980, and. In 1984 and in 1985, Duracon was the fastest growing company in Michigan. Uh, we uh, went public in 1985 and did a secondary offering in 1986. 1986 was a real monumental year in that uh, Duracon advertised in the 1986 Super Bowl down in New Orleans. And it was a really well-known game. It was the Chicago Bears with William the Refrigerator Perry and Jim McMahon and Richard mm -hmm. Dent. And they uh, they beat the Patriots that year, and and uh, that at that time there was a recession going on, and so no big advertisers in the state of Michigan advertised in the Super Bowl. There was no GM, no Ford, no Chrysler, nothing, and uh, a small no name company from Lapeer, Michigan, called Duracon. Uh, we blew our entire marketing wad in sixty seconds back then in nineteen eighty six. Uh, yeah, the 30 second commercials were $550,000. So they're about 10 times that cost today. We ran two 30 second commercials that people can watch today. If you were to Google Duracon, that's D U R A K O N, Duracon Super Bowl ad, it's a, it's a great ad. It, it really is. It basically shows two pickup trucks side by side. And there's a ton of bricks that falls into both of the beds of the, of the trucks. And then they clear out the, the bricks. And one truck is essentially destroyed and one truck was completely protected by the Duraliner. Mm -hmm. And so it really helped get the concept out there that this product existed to the to the number one automobile for the last 40 years in the world, which are pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. And so that that really helped put us uh, put us on the map. And uh, my dad sold his remaining interest uh, many years later uh, in 1991. He sold his remaining interest in the company. 
to a man by the name of Max Fisher. And um, we haven't been involved with Duracon since then, but that was the one that really kind of put us on the map and uh, started the flow of entrepreneurial spirit for me, my brothers and our, and our siblings and our, our kids. Well, you, you, that, that is a phenomenal uh, high level overview but since I am friends with you and I've had the opportunity uh, to hear the the deep dive story on some of these things, I want to, I want to let our listeners know that uh, there's a, a, some interesting aspects of that story. And like, cause, cause I've heard, I've heard you, you know, spend a little more time talking about like your, your dad being this top notch salesperson, he's just crushing it for his former company. And like, and the, the CEO or whatever that company calls them in and it's like, Hey, you know, you know what, um, uh, we're going to change the pay structure. We're going to change the comp structure. Right. And this is your dad's like, you know, got miles to feed and family and kids. And I, I don't know if you want to go down that path and tell anything about that story. But I mean, the, the fact that your dad had the courage to be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go out and start my own company. And, and just like, because it, it wasn't easy. I think a lot of times people take a look at entrepreneurship. They might even take, they might read like a Wikipedia uh, bio of your dad and be like, oh man, this guy's just brilliant. And he just, you know, everything was easy. Dude, your dad like put it all on red or all on black. I mean, he's just like, I'm all in. I am betting the farm multiple times for him to achieve this massive family success that you guys have had. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, inspires me when I chat with you is you've got a lot of that DNA in you. I think your dad taught you how to do it. And I see you teaching your son and your daughter to have that same type of courage, that same type of, I'm never going to quit. Uh, any type of obstacle I run up against, th there's where there's a will, there's a way, keep taking a couple more steps. But m multiple times in life, you're going to have to go all in. If you want great success, you've got to go all in and bet it all. Don't you? You do. You do. And at the same time, I think you do need to be smart about it. I, I wouldn't advise that people take chances for the sake of taking chances. They're, it's, an, it's an educated risk. It's a calculated risk. Um, back before Duracon, my dad worked for a company that had a bedliner product. It wasn't very good. It had deficiencies, but it was, uh, it was a first-generation product, and he did really, really well as their top salesperson. And one day the president of that company brought him into the uh, office and my dad's name is Mike. And he said, Hey, Mike, you're doing great, but I need to change your comp plan. And my dad is thinking that doesn't sound good. And I'm crushing all of my goals. I'm reaching everything that you set. And he said, you are Mike, but at this rate, I'm the president of the company and you're going to make more money than I am. And so that was his justification for attempting to reduce my dad's comp was because it was that just shows you how short sighted some business leaders can be, because I would love to be at a company where my salespeople make more than I do, because that is that is fantastic. And that means the company is, is doing, doing really, really well. And so my dad's response to that was, if you if you negatively affect my compensation, I am going to walk out the door and I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to compete directly with you. And the president said, there's the door. And so uh, less than a year later, he was uh, up and running with Duracon. And at that time, when you're first starting out, you had to go out and get the, the polyethylene. You had to find out who's going to ship this. What kind of a trucking company are we going to use? Um, who's going to make it? Who's going to, you know, where are these, these molds back in the 1980s? that you would make a bed liner out of mm -hmm. were a quarter of a million dollars a piece. So you're heavily in debt. And, and this is where I'm saying you just don't throw caution to the wind and, and, and throw your life savings at any idea that happens to pop your head pop into your head. But I will say, you know, I was born in 1966. And so I was about 13 or 14 years old when all of this started. And I know that the funding for the business was my parents deciding together that they would take out a second mortgage on the home. And so I've got, uh, you know, at the time in 1980-ish, I have uh, a brother that's about 16 and a half. I'm 14 and my younger brother was 13. And so college is on the horizon and family bills are always have to be paid. And you just have to wonder what, you know, what kind of backbone 
do you need to have on an idea to risk not only your family's well-being, but three kids' college education and your overall livelihood. My mm-hmm. my parents did not come from money. Um, and that's a big risk to put it all on red, like you yep. said. And so it, it obviously worked out really, really well. The company uh, grew very quickly and uh, and went went public in 1984. And, you know, uh, it was a terrific run, but it was also just as importantly uh, an amazing explanation of what in America, what the entrepreneurial spirit can do for you. I want to double click on one aspect of this. When your dad, or, I know you're a teenager at the time, so you might not know all these ins and outs, of the, uh, but it, it strikes me, your dad's trying to put together an entire company from scratch. So you're talking about trucking and warehousing molds. Um, manufacturing facilities, uh, duplicating everything from the ground up. Uh, did he just have a lot of really good resources and contacts that where he knew where all that was? Did he have people that came alongside him? Did, did he hire a couple of key people who helped him along the way? Or did he literally just shoestring this all together by himself, putting literally every single piece of the puzzle like, uh, I'm just going to go open up the Rolodex or open up a, you know yellow pages and start calling people? Right. I, I, I think he definitely... Uh picked up a lot along the way. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the things you and I were talking about in a prior conversation was I get such a kick out of helping that my daughter is uh, is 26 now and she lives uh, in Scottsdale and has uh, several businesses that she is um, uh, growing as we speak. And to be able to go over balance sheets and financial statements and depreciation schedules, talk about tax planning mm-hmm. is something I certainly never did at, at, at that age. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so to, to go over that sort of those sort of so, sorts of things with her, I remember asking my dad, how did you learn all this stuff? I mean, my, my dad uh, finished high school, but with three young kids uh, to feed you know, didn't have time for college because he had to put my head, put food on the table. Mm -hmm. And he said, Jeff, I believe me, I have got, I have paid for three MBAs over having to pay CPAs and CFOs and, and people around me to educate me Mm -hmm. on what I needed to do as a businessman. So it was a collective effort that my dad certainly uh, spearheaded but he had he he found good executives and he found good accountants. Uh, I know we had a relationship for thirty years with uh, still have a relationship with BDO Seedman here in Detroit, a, a top accounting firm, and they were there at the at the early days. So it is important that when you identify things that you don't know, you've got to get good help because mm-hmm. you can make one really big bad decision that can have really lasting results. So he definitely, uh, you know, in our heyday, I, th- I believe there were between four and 500 employees. Uh, almost all the liners were made in Lapeer, Michigan, and then shipped through a shipping service throughout the country to uh, to local car dealerships was our primary way of, of selling these things. You know, obviously the, the internet didn't exist back then, and everything was really done manually in the old-fashioned way of yeah, you make the liners in a manufacturing facility and you ship them from here to California. I just, I actually didn't know that your dad did not have a formal college education. And I've met him multiple times and he is like you know, so smart. I, I had no idea that he was just like a self-made man, had taught himself and had so many great advisors. Um it's amazing that he was able to build a company and then take it to an IPO and exit like he did just literally by sheer force of nature, force of will, hard work. Uh, double click a little bit on what you have seen both in um, his life and in your life, uh, the, the power and the importance of education. You know, it does, like you said, it doesn't have to be a formal education. It, you can be self-taught. I'm sure your dad picked up all sorts of books along the way. He's had mentors, had coaches. Um, I've, I've watched you and your career, uh, how you're a voracious reader. You're constantly learning and, and getting involved in new things. Uh, I know that you're working with your kids right now to teach them and help them in their entrepreneurial journey. What do you see as uh, the importance of education today for young people or even maybe mid-career people who are looking at starting something new or, you know, advance in their career? 
Well, I, I think we we saw with my with my parents' primary focus being three young boys, uh, you know, all within five years of each other, basically starting as teenagers. While college wasn't uh, wasn't a, an option for them at that that time, I believe everybody since them went to college. So mm-hmm. they they do place a large emphasis on future generations being being well schooled. And uh, I think that's that's probably my dad would identify with the fact that he just had to pay so much more in the business world because he didn't have that formal education mm-hmm. and 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 maybe they didn't have the means. And certainly that that plays a role as well. But when you identify that your foundation should be a strong education, uh, maybe that saves you years. Maybe that creates ideas. Maybe that opens up opportunities that you didn't even know existed, but you learned about them in community college or or university setting. Mm-hmm. And so uh, everyone in our family that I can think of since them has gone on to graduate from college. And so it's it's of high importance. Uh, my parents uh, are are constantly. Uh, updating themselves on current events, whether they be political or or business. Uh, I mean, they're uh, they just turned seventy eight years old, and they really know what's going on in the world. They they keep in touch with with everything on a global scale. They know exercise and health is extremely important because if you don't have your health, you you know what do you have? Yeah, and sure. they you know I I expect them to be around for another twenty years because they. They keep their minds and their bodies active and fresh and, and up to date. Well, I know you are a, a proud graduate of the second best university in the United States. The, Is that uh, behind Tennessee? Behind Tennessee, yes. I, w- I, I would not I would not say the University of Michigan. I wouldn't do that to you because you are a proud Michigan State graduate. I am. And, uh, so <laughs> I had to throw that in there, just tease you a little bit. Yeah, and I uh, I met Gary Minerich, your your dear friend. Uh, mm-hmm. We were we room blind at Michigan State, and not only did we end up uh, rooming together for four years, we were best men in each other's weddings. We climbed Pikes Peak, we climbed Kilimanjaro, we raised our have raised our children together, and um, really really fortunate to to have met him and to have uh, accomplished the things that. We have accomplished, and um, my daughter, my son, are both Michigan State graduates. Uh, their mom went to Michigan State, and and so yes, I, I bleed green with the best of them, and I'm I'm still to this day very involved with the school. Yeah, it's a fantastic university, and uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, you know watching. I, you know, since social media is amazing, but I, I've watched your son grow up, and you know, but playing sports and all the various things that he's been doing. Uh, there in Michigan, and of course, Madison, and how she's uh, graduated from Michigan State and gone on to entrepreneurial success around the country. So you're doing a great job of uh, teaching and training the next generation. Um, tell me some of the things that you're w- w- trying to motivate and inspire your uh, children right now. If you, um, if, if, let's say you've got uh, parents that are listening, they might have uh, young children. Um, what would be words of encouragement that you would give parents uh, now that you have two that you've helped launch? Uh, and I would say that you've been very successful in doing that. And when you look back as a, as, as a dad, are, what are the things that you're like, man, I'm really glad I did this. And if, are there things that you look back on and say, you know, I, I wish I could have done better here. I wish I would have done this. I, this is something I learned late as a parent or as a father. And you want to tell some young parents to maybe follow in your footsteps. I think my brothers and I learned at a very, very young age, and this isn't for everybody, but at a very young age, we learned that we did not want to work for somebody else for very long. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea, a great idea for high school and college graduates to go work for successful companies and get some experience and training and that sort of thing. Uh, That's not to say that you can't start your own business right out of college, but uh, you know, a lot of times, whether you take off and you, you know, spend a couple of years in Chicago or go to New York or Scottsdale or wherever you want to be, uh, I think the twenties are the perfect time to do that. You know, there's, there's going to be time in life for everything else, for the families and for the children and for marriages and all that sort of thing. But you really, in most cases, you only get one opportunity to literally leave the comforts of home and go anywhere. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you ha- you'll you'll never have more disposable income or disposable time or less responsibility than when you're done with school. And so, um, it, I I do I always thought I, you know I'm a, a Detroit guy and a Michigan um, state of Michigan guy. I can't say Michigan guy. I'm yeah, a state of Michigan. I, I almost caught you there. I was like, oh wow. I'm a state of Michigan guy and. I thought that I was uh, going to spend my 20s in Chicago. I just always loved that city. And, and you know, as I look back on it, you know, before I knew it, I was into a job here in Detroit and and got married. And before you know it, kids are on the way. And, and that opportunity kind of passes you. So I would just strongly recommend that, uh, that young adults uh, take the bull by the horns and get out of your comfort zone. Go someplace you've always wanted to be. Because you know what? Home is always home. Mm-hmm. Home is always open, and as a matter of fact, my uh, I told I told my daughter Madison and I told my son Michael that um, after college you can do whatever you want, but the one thing you have to do, and you're always welcome back, but you got to leave. And it's tough because you don't see your kids every day, mm-hmm. but yeah, Madison could not be enjoying life more in Scottsdale. And she's got um, four businesses that she's involved with that she's running um, that keeps her uh, keeps her really, really busy. And I remember I remember her in her infinite wisdom. She told me something either right when she graduated Michigan State or right before graduation. She said, Dad, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I know it's not behind a desk. Mm -hmm. And so you know, she has a, uh, she's got a company in, in Scottsdale called Icon Itinerary, where she brings groups, whether they be golf groups, bachelorette parties, uh, universities come in, you know, the Super Bowl is there this year, and she takes care of all their reservations, whether they be for bars, restaurants, golfing, indoor skydiving, uh, you know, ATV rides, mountain hiking, all that sort of thing. And she uh, and she takes care of all that stuff that nobody wants to do when they're on vacation. Mm-hmm. And that's going really well. She and her girlfriend and, an, and another guy in Scottsdale bought a party bus called Scottsdale Party Bus Crawler. So people uh, can come in and rent up to 22 people on this bus and they're tooling around Old Town Scottsdale, listening to music, stopping at restaurants and bars and traveling at about five miles an hour, just tooling around the town, having a great time. And they're and that business is just killing it. Wow. She's uh, she's the arena host for the Arizona Coyotes hockey team. And uh, and she's also helping me in a in a new business that I'm uh, that I have started about a year ago that has to do with helping small business owners that were hurt by COVID and uh, getting them sizable refunds through what's called the employee retention tax credit. She's helping me generate leads for that business. And so she's she's loving it and more so than anything. You know what has the biz- biggest effect on me, Bob, is she said, Dad, when I walk out the door every day out of my apartment. I feel like I'm on vacation oh, that's awesome. and uh, she just was never a, a, a Michigan weather fan. You mm-hmm. know, you know, we're in the jury days of Michigan right now where it's rare that we even see the sun. And, and so for her to walk out her door every day and see palm trees and sunshine um, is what's really important to her. And uh, I don't, while she comes and visits all the time and I visit her, she's not going to be moving back here anytime soon. I, I remember uh, back uh, I went to um, a Pistons game. If, I, if memory serves me correctly, I, rem- I remember going to a um, a game, and sh- and I was like, oh, "Is that Maddie Wayne?" Right? <laughs> and she's like, literally on the big screen, and she's doing right. All, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Um, but yeah, it's amazing. She was doing it when she was here in Michigan. She was, I think, working either for, it was for the Pistons and maybe even. Um, uh, the Red Wings, if I'm not mistaken. And then she, yeah. So it's like, it's amazing to see, you know, how she's you know, taken uh, her entrepreneurial pursuits all across the country. And of course, I know your, your son, Michael, is going to be following in her footsteps when he graduates from uh, Michigan State as well. Yeah, they're, they were both marketing majors and entrepreneurship minors at, uh, at Michigan State. And yeah, she did parlay that Pistons job into a, into an arena host job at the Coyotes. And i uh, uh, she she loves that sort of thing. She loves having a microphone uh, in her hand. Um, she uh, was instrumental in 
a, a dear friend of ours, uh, yours and mine, Bob, uh, by the name of John James. Uh, John is a, is a uh, member of uh, YPO, Young Presidents Organization, that, uh, that Bob is in, and I was in, but I'm too old now. And anyway, Madison introduced uh, John James to uh, a crowd of about 4,000 people, uh, introduced uh, Donald Trump Jr. to the crowd, and she just excels in that kind of environment. She She's a really outgoing uh, woman uh, with a great head on her shoulders, and, and uh, John would be the first one to tell you that uh, Maddie was really, really important to to him and to his campaign and to getting people involved and getting people fired up. And, and I'm really, really uh, delighted to report that uh, John has very recently joined Congress. Uh, he won the 10th district spot here in Michigan. And uh, he and his wife, Liz, and their boys are, are just beyond excited for that. And they spend a lot of their time now in Washington, DC, uh, and also uh, here in Oakland County, Michigan. Yeah, he's, he's a phenomenal leader, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, an army uh, helicopter pilot, so he's an officer, I believe West Point graduate, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But it, John is the exact type of person that we need in Washington, uh, a, a phenomenal leader, a man of courage, a man of integrity. Uh, so I saw Madison, you know, helping him out. And I think there were times, if I'm not mistaken, uh, she was on the same stage with Kid Rock, you know, various Michigan um, um, men and women of note and, and uh, people that were getting behind John and being like, this is the type of leader that we need for our community, for our state. Uh, so I, I am so excited that he's in Washington, D.C. And certainly, even though I wasn't able to cast a vote for him, I was certainly supporting him. And um, wow, I tell you what, it's just, it's amazing. I can, I can see as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm watching you on Zoom. You're talking about your kids. We, we started off talking about mountains. Then we started talking about a little about your, your business background. But the thing that kind of, I've watched it tug at your heart is when you're talking about your son and your daughter, I can tell that you're like reliving all those memories as a dad, you know, all the times that, you know, you were with, you know, Michael at Brother Rice, uh, the, the various places that you've been, maybe with, I, you're, you, you're such a prolific poster on social media when you were with Madison up there at Michigan State and joined a good basketball game or football game. And it, I can tell, I mean, you're, you're kind of, you're tearing up a little bit. And um, you're just, yeah, it's just, I, I like to see the emotion coming out of you. You're, you're not just a stoic mountain climber and businessman, but the, the, the things that matter most to you in life, you're, you, you get emotional when you're talking about it. I do. I mean, if you're going to get emotional, emotional about something, it, you know, it ought to be uh, your family, uh, your 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 kids, especially your parents, that sort of thing. I have a I have a wonderful wife named Leah who has also uh, got the entrepreneurial sp uh, spirit going. She she started a, a company a couple of years ago called Top Gun Talent, and uh, that name is not coincidental. I am a Top Gun nerd, Bob. I uh, you won't find a bigger fan. On the planet than me, I, I've seen Top Gun Maverick nine times already. I've probably oh I've probably seen the first Top Gun uh, over I don't even know how many dozens of times. I know every word to both movies. My dog, his name is Maverick. <laughs> okay, so here's here's the question. I just I want to interrupt you just real quick because I will tell you that one of the funniest things that I witnessed ever in my life was when we were, uh, I, we must've been about 10,000, 11,000 feet on Kilimanjaro. And I hear a noise coming from your tent and you and Gary are in this tent. And I'm like, and there's, it's windy outside. It's cold. I'm like, what in the world is going on? It sounds like there's like a, a TV going and I unzip your tent and the two of you are laying in there and you hadn't told a soul, but you had lugged up. Remember you were talking just a second ago, ounces equal pounds, pounds equal pain. You lugged up on the side of Kilimanjaro of a little like portable DVD player. And the two of you there laying in your tent watching movies i'm like you scoundrel it how come you didn't just movies bob it was a seven inch battery powered dvd and i have one dvd and we were watching top gun i was that's what i was going to ask you was it top gun was that the movie 
it was unequivocally 1000% it was Top Gun. Oh my gosh, you are such a boss. I was like, I can, this guy literally was in the parking lot jettisoning power bars and, you know, tape that we might need, things that were life-saving. And little did I know at the bottom of this huge backpack that you were carrying up, you had a DVD player. Now, you okay. know what, Bob, though, that, that makes me uh, think of, of you in another way because, you know, I would say more so than summiting Kilimanjaro, the most memorable thing about going to uh, to Killy with you and with Gary and the other guys that we knew was our guide took us to his hometown. And I don't think his town had ever seen white people before. I remember that. we had to walk in the center of town on this dirt road and these shacks that are held up by, I mean, their houses were pieces of tin laying up against each other, mm -hmm. but we had to walk hand in hand so that the, the town people knew that we were friendly mm -hmm. and inside this town was an orphanage and we went and visited an orphan orphanage. And I can say, I have never visited an orphanage before the one that I visited in Tanzania. And, um, your dad is a pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's been on many mission trips. And so he gave you some incredible device that, uh, advice that really changed my trip for me. And that was something as simple of as uh, simple as he said, Bob, bring a big bag of Jolly Ranchers. I mean, we all know what Jolly Ranchers are. And so we're we go to this orphanage and these kids, they're scared. They've never seen white people. They don't know if we're ghosts. They don't know if we're evil. They don't know anything. There's no Internet. There's no TV. There's no communication of any kind. There's no technology. There's no plumbing. There's no electrical. Mm -hmm. And. So finally, one little kid looks like he's four years old, five years old, just peeks his head around the corner. And our guide, uh, his name was Frank, uh, kind of waved him over and he had to coax him out a little bit. And before you knew it, there was another one and another one and another one coming around the corner. And, and finally, they slowly walked up to us and didn't really know what to make of us because they'd never seen uh, white humans before. And but Frank talked them into that told them in Swahili that we were safe and we were friends and and that we had a gift for them. And so you broke out the Jolly Ranchers and and handed one to Frank and Frank handed it to this little boy. And the crazy thing is that just doesn't enter our minds is this little boy takes the Jolly Rancher and puts it directly in his mouth without removing the wrapper. Mm -hmm. he doesn't know. I mean, mm -hmm. how would you know? And so, so, you know, Frank had to tell him in Swahili, no, 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 no. And so he, he explained to him that you, how to unwrap the wrapper and put the Jolly Rancher in his mouth. And then the next thing he did was a little boy just bit down on it and like cracked the Jolly Rancher with his molars. And <laughs> so then you had to teach him, no, that's not how you do it either. And, and before you knew it, you know, the next kid tried his, this was the very first piece of candy these kids had ever had in their lives. And when they when they felt the taste of that in their mouths, their eyes lit up like saucers and more and more kids came out. And so had your dad not given you that advice, I mean, we would have had an incredible trip to the orphanage, but it's something that I will take with me to my deathbed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to, to be able to give a, to give a child his first piece of candy and and to be able to communicate with people who I could not have otherwise communicated with. Uh, was a uh, was one of life's great moments. Yeah, it was so so many learning lessons there. Uh, I still have pictures uh, from time to time. I will open up an album and I'll look at you know you know the people that we met. And it, and as fun as the adventure of climbing Killy was, I do think you know going out into the Serengeti, uh, out into some of these villages and the the, the orphanage that you're speaking about, it, it definitely burns a memory uh, in your mind that you 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 can never forget that, and you just like you feel. Um, if you have a hard day and you're going through some tough challenges in life, you're just like, you know what, no, no matter how tough it may be, we are so blessed, so fortunate here in the West, and especially here in the United States with, you know, we've got in my home, I don't, how many dozen, you know, uh, spigots or outlets do I have fresh, clean running water whenever I want to? And, oh, it's magic. I can hit this button and it's hot. And I've got, you know, it's just, it's, we take so much for granted. And, you know, the one thing that w was 
um, memorable for me. I could not believe the sheer joy and happiness um, on people's faces once that as you're walking through um, the, the, these villages, the little, little children with literally nothing, and yet they just had the biggest smiles. And it, it, to them, it, it, it was you know they were with mom, dad. They were living. Uh, now this is you know not out in the orphanage, but it's just the, the the happiness, the simplicity of life, and uh, and folks kind of just happy. And I was just like, wow. You know, in, in many respects, there there's folks here that are more content than they have nothing, and they've found happiness, peace, and joy, and contentment. Um, and we've got people in the West who have literally everything and are miserable. Yeah, it is really remarkable. I think I think everybody has their own definition of what the word poor means, and and those of us that grew up near near big uh, inner cities like Detroit or you know New York or Chicago or or LA, you just, you know how, you know, we have this image of what poor is on because of what we see on televisions and things like that, but it truly doesn't compare to African poor. Mm -hmm. In Africa, if you can flip a switch and a light goes on, or you can move a spigot and water comes out, you are not poor in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's remarkable. That's really what I learned uh, probably uh, the most there on this topic is man, these people have nothing. They have to literally uh, kill what they or eat, what they kill. There is no employment mm -hmm. in Africa. They, they make jewelry and they sell it to tourists and they um, there is some farming. Um, there are some few, a few big cities that might have some hotels and markets in them, but 95% um, of Africa isn't that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a it's a crazy. Uh, there were multiple times where I had to remind myself, "You're in their country, mm -hmm. and this is normal. This what what we're seeing here is is not America, and it's it was beautiful in its own way, but it was raw in other ways mm -hmm. where most Americans wouldn't last a week, mm -hmm. and yet these people have lived for centuries here. Yeah. I remember our uh, entrepreneurial minds were in overdrive as we were uh, driving down the road one day, and I forget what town we were exiting. It may have been Arusha, and it was just for as far as the eye could see. Yeah, uh, you had women, uh, young women, older women, all ages, with jugs of water on their head. They were go carrying it from a w one water source. And we were asking the, our guides, we're like, hey, what's going on? So what's the deal here? It's like, oh yeah, there might be one or two clean water sources in a particular area. And women on a daily basis will walk, not just a mile or two, we're talking a 10 and 12 miles, crazy distances with an empty jug to go get clean water and then walk it back to their little home just so they can have enough uh, basically to cook. It's not to wash, it's to, it's to cook and to drink. And right. you could see the strain on some of those uh, young girls. And I guess this was like, I guess the, the girl's job to do. And I remember where I was sitting there like, okay, what, what, what can we come up with? How do we, how do we invent something where it would, um, obviously we want to go in and we want to put, you know, clean water sources everywhere and get it, get it. But there had to have been a better way to transport water for these people, you know, all those distances. But I mean, it, you'd find, it was like odds and ends. Like they'd find some piece of trash or a milk jug or a, a, a buck. Sometimes it was just an open air bucket. And you're like, hold on a second. You just walked like 10 miles with a bucket, man. If you trip and fall, that water goes everywhere, right? And like you right. have to start all over again. It's like, come on, there's got to be. We've, there's, and I just remember just constant. It's like, how do we lean in and how do you help? But you almost don't even know where to start, right? It was so overwhelming. It is truly, truly overwhelming. I mean, the world's greatest resource, of course, is water, and that's exponentially true in in Africa. I know uh, there are a lot of drives and a lot of great causes for. Uh, for more, for better water purification and, and that sort of thing. And I remember even back then hearing like a 10 cent donation can get a gallon of clean water mm -hmm. to people in Africa. And I think, I think our only problem with that is, uh, is that people really trusted that they knew that their contributions were actually going 
toward water creation and purification that they wouldn't have a problem with it. But I don't know how, uh, I mean, now nowadays it's a little bit different because there are areas in Africa that, that do have internet. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy to say that I still communicate uh, on on the internet with my guide from Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. and he just celebrated a birthday and and we communicate from time to time and I think there is a, a an entrepreneurial spirit over there but they're just so far behind and they're at such a disadvantage in so many ways that that it's it's a lot harder to be successful there I believe than it is certainly in America. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I interrupted you a moment ago uh, when you were telling us a little bit about you know, your wife Leah's uh, top Top Gun business. I don't, I didn't want to cut her her short. You need to, you need to let us know what she's so. It's Top Gun. Is it Top Gun Talent? Is that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, her her website is topguntalent.com, dot com, and okay. it's just a thriving business. For uh, she 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 does it. she specializes, I would say, in a lot of uh, higher end computer programmers, CFOs. She's really big in the restoration business, execs and project managers, things of that nature. And, and so uh, she has so many jobs available for qualified applicants that if, if, um, if people are, are looking for employment, looking for advancement, looking for um, uh, something greater on that horizon, they should visit topguntalent.com because um, her greatest uh, enjoyment that she has told me so many times when people finally get that job that they've always wanted and it's mm -hmm. a great paying job and it's something they have fired up to get to in the morning uh, as opposed to the one that they're dreading that they're really only at to get a paycheck uh, that that really fulfills uh, uh, you know a lot of a lot of needs that people have, a lot of entrepreneurial needs where um, when you're doing something that you love to do and you can make money on it, mm -hmm. it doesn't get better than that. And and that's uh, that's what I'm finding. Uh, you know, you and I were talking last week about uh, about my new business called Max ERC Refund. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had previously, and I still do, I own a couple of uh, what are called Cycle Bar Fitness Studios or Indoor oh. Cycling. And um, Cycle Bar is a is a national uh, indoor cycling franchise, and there's about oh 265 ish uh, open Cycle Bars, and gyms in general were really hurt, probably more so than any other industry that I'm aware of, hurt by the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine Bob trying to jam a lot of people into a small space and having them breathe heavy all at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, that's what boutique fitness is. And so they were the most restricted industry. They were the first to close, the last to open. And one of the things that really helped me as a cycle bar owner was part of the CARES Act of 2020 was uh, a program called the Employee Retention Tax Credit. Mm -hmm. That did was uh, for small businesses like a cycle bar that have W-2 employees that their sales were hurt by COVID, there's financial relief. And it's actually the biggest government stimulus program for small businesses ever at $400 billion. So um, I, I, while I have my cycle bar studios, I, I uh, spend most of my time on max ERC refund. And I am getting millions of dollars of federal stimulus into the hands of small business owners that were hurt by COVID. And uh, it's, it's a pretty easy qualification. If your company was hurt by COVID and you have W-2 employees mm -hmm. uh, and you haven't yet filed for ERC, then we can help. And, and I, I, there's nothing more enjoyable than starting a business and helping people survive, helping people flourish and enjoy doing what you're doing. I mean, there's times when I feel like Santa Claus. I called I called somebody yesterday and told them, you know, you've got $69,000 coming from the IRS. It'll take about four months to process. They can't believe it. We've had uh, we've had uh, refunds up to six million dollars to businesses. That's incredible. Um, it's, it, it's really from about uh, companies that are about five employees in size to five hundred employees in size. I mean, uh, I would say some of the most rewarding ones have been when I can get a, a small muffler shop thirty thousand dollars or mm -hmm. a hair salon twenty thousand dollars. You know, sometimes it's more gratifying than getting a manufacturing company $400,000 because mm -hmm. it can truly be life-changing. That company was going to go out of business. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, 30 percent of all gyms across the country got taken out by COVID. Yeah. This can be the lifeline that that small business owners that were hurt uh, a need to survive. And right. so I, I just I really, really enjoy what I what I do. I'm I'm working on it in some capacity seven days a week. And uh, it's been such a successful program that uh, Congress has expanded or extended uh, portions of this program uh, that we're going to end at the end of this year. They have now expanded them all the way through April of 2025. Oh, my goodness. And so it's not a program that's that's going to end soon. Uh, but if uh, man, I'm telling you, if small if you're a small business owner out there and your sales were down, say, by 20 percent or more in any quarter of 2021, uh, there's money to be to be had um, as a stimulus. And the great thing that a lot of people remember PPP. Yeah. Most, most businesses did PPP. And um, the vast majority of those businesses had those loans forgiven. But you'll remember, Bob, that they had to be spent in a certain way, mostly on payroll or rent mm -hmm. or utilities. Well, ERC dollars don't have that. Uh, they can be they can be reinvested back into the business. They can be uh, taken as a bonus. They can be spent any way they want uh, by the small business owner. So it's not a loan and there are no use restrictions. And so, it's, uh, you know, there's a handful of reports that we need and we typically turn a file around within 72 hours and we'll let you know whether or not you're eligible and how much the potential uh, ERC refund is. Yeah. And, you know, for a lot of those entrepreneurs, you're talking, you know, small smaller business owners many times you know they were continuing to make payroll they were keep continuing to keep the doors open uh and in entrepreneurship uh it's so funny people who are not entrepreneurs don't know this but a lot of times it's the entrepreneur who's the last one to get paid they're taking out the second mortgage on the house they're taking out you know bank notes and loans they're doing everything they possibly can to keep the business open they're you know paying their staff and um, so for the, you know, this ERC, it's allowing them to actually get paid back um, to be able to, you know, pay down some of those, maybe those loans they took out or the mortgage they took out to be able to keep their business uh, alive. So, you know, I've, I know that this is, it's growing in popularity. I think as more and more people understand it, uh, super excited that you're able to help uh, American businesses stay open and flourish and help those entrepreneurs. We'll definitely put uh, a link uh, not only to uh, Lilia's um, Top Gun uh, talent, but uh, also to uh, Max ERC. We'll get your website out there in the show notes. Uh, and I'll also put uh, a, a little uh, shout out there for Madison, so for anybody who's taken a, uh, a trip to uh, going to the Super Bowl, or maybe you want to go on a golf trip, uh, you're going to Scottsdale, you want to have a lot of fun. Uh, I will give you a couple of websites to go and you've got a friend down there who will plan it from start to finish and make sure that your event is uh, a memorable experience. So yeah, there's some, you're going to get to experience multiple Wayne enterprises. So, uh, are you, so are you telling, are you Batman? Is that, is that what you are? Are you Wayne, Wayne enterprises? People, uh, and when I spell my name, people say, are you related to Bruce? But I will say what they all have in common is all of our businesses help people in one way or another. Well, whether or not it's uh, Leah having somebody find the job of their career or or Madison helping a group uh, have a great time in Scottsdale or the ERC business helping uh, small businesses survive, there's there's nothing more enjoyable than, uh, than making a living uh, doing something that people need, they appreciate, and you enjoy providing. So what, what have you learned in uh, those operations Jeff, in terms of just like um, in, in the people business, these are all very, like you said, people centric, people first, uh, providing an incredible service. What are some of the skill sets that you have found to be invaluable uh, in your entrepreneurial pursuits? I've, I've heard multiple thought leaders here recently saying, you know what, we're living in this age with chat GPT and AI and all the all these advancements in technology and so many things that are just kind of rote um, that can be done by AI are going to be automated away. And the skills of the future that people really need to double down on are uh, the soft skills. It's the relationship skills. It's um, communication. It's building trust. It's building community. Uh, it, it strikes me that these are all things that you're, you and your family are 
experts at and you do very well in, in the course of business. But what, what have you learned? Do you agree with that statement? Are there other things that you see that you're like, hey, this is a skill set, Bob, that's been invaluable in my career? I think I, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. I think it kind of depends on which business you're talking about. But, you know, when you when you described it the way you just did, I was thinking that my my prior uh, entrepreneurial life was very face to face. I mean, whether I, now I didn't, uh, I worked at Duracon in the summers trimming liners in a sweatshop. And so I wasn't really, you know, I was a teenager and, and my dad uh, thought it would be invaluable for me to, to learn what I didn't want to do the rest of my mm -hmm. life. And, but most of the other Duracon business was salespeople going out and calling on uh, car dealerships and meeting face to face about uh, Duraliners. Uh, I had another company for 23 years called Dynamic Rehab, where we completed 1.1 million spinal patient visits. We specialized in back neck, back pain and neck pain. So that was a very much a face to face, hands on uh, type of collaboration. And then uh, even Cyclebar, you know, you've got instructors that are that are in a room motivating riders to to uh, to grow physically, emotionally, spiritually, that sort of thing. But, you know, now that you mention it, when I think about the ERC business, mm -hmm. I haven't personally met 95% of my clients because they're from all over the country. Right. And you're doing it via Zoom like this? Yeah, yeah. We, we, if, if that's what they would like to do, I do Zoom calls all the time. But with the uh, you know, the proliferation of, of the internet and Zoom and texting and email, um, more of the businesses today are becoming less face and face to face. I mean, maybe some things don't change uh, in, in certain businesses, but I mean, I would say the same is probably true with Leah mm -hmm. and, and her Top Gun talent company, because she doesn't meet face to face with most of her applicants. Um, and if she meets with her her business clients, it would you know be on a on a rare instance. And um, uh, same thing with um, with Madison with Icon Itinerary. She may be having a company you know a group of eight golfers want to come in, or or twenty people want to come in for a reunion, and they're coming in from Atlanta, Georgia. You know there isn't really that necessity anymore to meet with them. Uh, face to face because everything is arranged uh, electronically. And so it's just interesting that when I go from the prior family businesses that I was involved with, they were all face to face and, and personal. And now you fast forward to today and most things are, are not that I, I do try as much as I can to press upon with my kids, how important that those types of things can still be like, I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask Madison or I'll ask Michael to, uh, to follow up on something and they will say, okay, I'll send them a text. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, we've already done that a couple of times. So I need you to pick up the phone and have a human conversation with this person, mm -hmm. you know, initiate a zoom call, put a face behind the name because we all get a hundred texts a day and we all get a hundred emails a day. And most of them get scanned over and deleted. And so you've got to do something that stands out. And if they, if you can put your face behind your name, it's going to be that much more impactful. And so I, I really, I think it's a, kind of a blend of the two. I mean, we want to be as personal as we can. Nobody really wants to talk to a bot. Mm -hmm. And um, in, inevitably, when you're in those scenarios, you want to talk to a human. And so nowadays, it seems like we live in a situation where your best case scenario online is to talk to a human, but you almost never actually meet that person in your sales. You could be buying or selling things on Amazon or um, or doing the things that uh, that I've mentioned with our family businesses and human mm -hmm. interaction has got to be at a at a planet low. Mm -hmm. What, so are there things that you uh, specifically are doing when you when you know now that you're in this business where most of the interaction is not done face to face or in person? What what are things that you're doing to try to build relationship, to, to build that connection, to build trust, um, to stand out? I love I, I, that word was on the tip of my tongue when you were. Uh, telling Madison or you know, Michael, be like, no, we, we we need to have, you know, go do something different. We need to stand out. Um, so is there anything in particular that you're finding very helpful? 
Well, I think what, what can be tough in this world is when you are, you know, like, for example, I'll just, I'll stay on the ERC front. I, people are being inundated mm-hmm. with TV ads, social media ads, radio ads regarding the employee pension tax credit. So what I try to do and, and my staff tries to do is we have to get to a level of some level of trust. And so if I can talk about my history or I can talk about things that are more personal, I'm just not the run of the mill person who's trying to collect leads. I can I can send them the information that gives them some peace of mind. I can give them uh, information that's directly from the IRS.gov. I can talk about uh, customers that are like them that just recently completed the process so that they they don't feel like they're being lied to. I think uh, I think it's important to find your own way to be as trustworthy as possible, and especially when you're talking about um, you know government dollars and, mm-hmm. and stimulus and things like that. And because you know because I can't go out and visit people in Idaho and Arkansas and Arizona on a regular basis, like on a daily basis, we are. We are closing deals. I mean, mm-hmm. we're giving millions of dollars to these people. I, I just, I can't get out and get into their offices. Right. I'd be more than happy to be face to face with them. I think when you, when you do that, that helps some, gives people some peace of mind. Um, but it's just about building trust. And, mm-hmm. and I think everybody has their own way of doing that. Mine is just being myself and talking from my experiences and uh, having them uh, talk with people that have dealt with me in the past. Mm-hmm. That so far has worked out really, really well. I remember it kind of going down the same line here because it's so much of my business is also kind of pivoted through COVID and exiting COVID to where, you know, it's like this, you're getting on phone calls with people or Zoom calls and maybe you're, you're not uh, as in person as we used to be. And I know through COVID, um, I, w- I was really trying to be intentional in uh, making connection. Uh, in these types of environments. And I remembered advice that I got from a mentor early on in my business career. He said, Bob, you know, business is really easy. Business is all about relationships. And remember this, it's like people like to do business with people that they like. And people like people who are like themselves, right? Where you have a connection. So I've, I've, he was kind of inspiring me or motivating me to be like, if you're going to go and sit down with somebody, figure out where you have some commonality with that person, figure out where you've got some connection. Um, so I, I tell you what, I almost never take a business meeting with someone new for the first time where I have not gone out to LinkedIn first to, um, you know, hey, do, do, do we have commonality? Was this person an NCAA athlete? What school did they go to? Um, what do they like? You know, search them on social media. And the next thing you know, I'm on a conference call, but like, hey, Jeff, I, you know, I didn't know you like Michigan State. I like Michigan State too. I, I grew up right, you know, down the way. I used to go there when I was in high school. Now, you, now we're talking Michigan State. Now we're talking sports. But I think that sometimes when I get approached by people who uh, they're just so task oriented and they're just like, they want to close the deal. They get on like, hey, Bob, here's what I want to do. Just close the deal. I'll be like, hold on, time out. Can you take a second just to like say hello and like <laughs> have a personal conversation? So I'm sharing this for the young people who might be listening, but you know, it, it, take, a, take a minute, do a, little re, do a little research. And then when you're having those conversations, you know, I've found it to be extremely helpful for me in life to be, you know, find out those those commonalities and start talking a little bit about that. All of a sudden, you will find that the uh, topic of business when you guys start to move on to the business, right? It gets it's so much easier. Have you? Yeah, I'm sure you've noticed that, right? I mean, you're an expert in this. I couldn't agree more, and uh, that's especially true in my wife's Leah, my wife Leah's business, where if she's trying to find a a role that someone wants to ascend to. Mm-hmm. It's really helpful to pop into LinkedIn and she calls herself a professional stalker because, you know, to, to see, okay, where's their education? What were they doing at these last three jobs? How long were they there? Are they jumping around every six months, every year they get a new job? Or is this somebody who wants to grow some roots? Mm-hmm. Um, and especially when, you know, as I mentioned, she's she's got high end, uh, you know, out system developers that. Uh, that need to have a lot of qualifications. And, and so to know that going in that, well, you worked for three years at this company doing, using uh, this language or that language in computers, 
it just cuts to the chase. It gets it, it starts getting to the important meaty questions in addition to learning that um, oh you're you're part of the Vista Maria charity that helps that helps women or you're help you're you know you're a um, an alum of Michigan State or something like that. I think it is brings up good talking points, but also really relevant talking points. Uh, as it relates to their experience and what they might be qualified for or not qualified for, because you know you don't want to be wasting someone's time if this if this job, for example, is way over their head or or way underneath them as well. Mm-hmm. Well said. Well, so we're I mean, with all the things that you've done in your business career, um, do, where, where do you see or, or do you have insight into where you uh, zones of opportunity or things that you see coming down the pike? I mean, do you have any um, pronostications or you know, insights about the uh, the economy here in the next you know few months or this year. I mean, it seems like the, um, there, there's a lot of indications that the U.S. is uh, in a recession. Uh, many people are saying that we're going to be in a recession for a while for the, the course of this year. I think one of the things that was a bit surprising uh, is to see how many uh, huge layoffs are happening right now. Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter. Um, Salesforce. Um, well, just this weekend, I, I Google uh, announced. I mean, it, there, there, there's messages and videos on uh, TikTok and Instagram where you had yeah. Google salespeople who were literally out traveling around the country, meeting with clients. They go to they go out to dinner, and they're like, "All right, we'll see you in the morning, and we're going to go over a proposal." And in the middle of the night. The, the sales rep or the individual got laid off and, you know, and their, their email, everything's been shut down. I heard this morning uh, on a program that, that of the 10,000 people that were laid off by Google. Now, remember, this is you know, one of the most profitable companies in American uh, uh, history. Uh, the median income was 300,000. Think about that for a second. 300, it, it, the median income for 10,000 employees was 300,000. And, and and they're saying, hey, there, there may be more. So I mean, it's just, it's, we're in this really weird time, right? I would imagine that most of those people at Google thought, hey, I've got a safe and secure job. Uh, we're doing really well. We had what last quarter was 17 billion in profit. Um, hey, we're good. And so I don't know, what, what insights do you have? What do you see? I think back until about 2007 or eight, when we really got hurt bad by uh, by the world shakeup and the financial crisis that we had, people thought that the big company was where you wanted to be because it was safe, it was secure. Mm-hmm. There were pension plans. I always had some place to go. I was always going to have a check uh, to pay my bills. And uh, 2007 eight was a real wake up call because it proved that that could be one of the least safe places you could possibly be was corporate America. Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, you name it. And so they got pensions ripped away and they lost millions and millions of jobs and inflation was bad. And, you know, it's, we're kind of repeating history again. Uh, You know, I will say that, you know, I'm, uh, my beliefs are certainly lean conservative. I, I would say on a scale of one to 10, especially fiscally, I'm probably a seven or eight conservative. And uh, some people have have commented on me that it's rather ironic that I'm in the ERC business uh, because the companies that are in more liberal states like mm-hmm. California, New York, and Chicago, and um, because their restrictions were more severe and the shutdowns were more severe and the companies were more hurt than say conservative states like Montana and Ohio and Florida. Uh, that it's rather it's rather ironic that I'm that I'm helping businesses more in liberal states than I am in conservative states because they were hurt more. Mm-hmm. I'm just a belief that our economy uh, uh, is in a better spot when we have conservative leadership. It's just it's uh, it's not really a political statement. It's just I just don't feel as safe uh, from a business owner perspective. Uh, or from a stock market perspective, I mean, I I think Joe Biden had the first two years of uh, of the presidency were pretty good years in the stock market. I think he had a twenty eight percent return in year one and eighteen percent in year two, and um, and most of the eighteen percent was given back uh, last year. But 
I just don't feel the leadership. And mm. I, I, I think we, it's one thing to have bad things happen in the world and bad things happen in the economy. And you get some peace of mind when you have a strong leader who's got your back because you know it's not just all uh, cookies and ice cream. But I, I just, I don't feel like if we, uh, I don't feel the leadership that that I, I think this economy needs right now. And so, you know, I think you started this conversation by by talking about the layoffs of, of the Google and the Microsoft and all that. I think that lends itself well to more entrepreneurship. Yeah. Because if, you know, you think it's safe working at GM, Ford, Chrysler, Microsoft, Google, pick up a paper. Right. And uh, I, I'd rather fail on my own than, than have somebody else tell me I'm done. But Jason Calacanis, uh, over this, the past weekend, for, for those who are listening who may not uh, know who he is, he's a, a very prominent uh, venture capitalist in Silicon Valley and uh, host of one of the most popular podcasts uh, out there. But he, you know, he said that he views this as a all these engineers, all these people who, uh, you know, very smart coders, developers that are being laid off by Google and others. That we're going to see a resurgence of startups in the United States as these people exit and say, you know what, um, I've been playing it safe my nice job at Microsoft or Google or uh, Facebook. And hey, let's get a couple of us together and let's go start a company. And if you take a look at where the big companies, like the, the iconic American companies that well, we know of today, almost all of them were started in recessions during down, down periods, right? And people banded together and say, hey, let's go do something interesting. Let's go solve this problem. So I, I'm, uh, I, I am a little bit concerned about the economy as a whole. Uh, I think the ray of light that I have is that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of uh, turbulence and change, there's always a, a groups of people who who find opportunity. If you're if you're willing to lean in, if you're willing to learn, uh, learn and work, um, there are people. That, that's that's when opportunity is abundant. You just got to know you got to know where to look. You got to know how to lean in. And so I think we're going to see the next generation of, you know, iconic American companies uh, being started right now. Yes, I, I would. I would agree with that. And I would say also, Bob, when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship, you have to ask yourself, what what is it about a new company that you start that you find attractive? And the answer to that is very, very different based on your life experiences your age, and where you're at in this world. For example, if my whole background was in the 401k or the insurance world, maybe my utopia company would be that I rent 3,000 square feet, I have 10 offices, I have independent insurance guys that work for me, they're all doing well, they're all selling insurance or, or, or helping people provide for themselves in their 401k plan, and I've got a, a sign on my shingle outside, and every day I drive by that, it gives me uh, a warm spot in my heart, and it gives me peace of mind, whereas like I'll fast forward to what my perfect company looks like. My perfect company looks an awful lot like what I'm doing now and what my wife Leah is doing right now, where I can be in Michigan, mm -hmm. I can be visiting you in Tennessee, I could be in Guam. And as long as I have my phone and the internet, I can be anywhere and I have no rent, I have no payroll, and I have very little expense. Um, you know, I'm 56 years old. My kids are, are they're, they're growing up. I, I've got a freshman in college now. And so I'm, I'm pretty much an empty nester. That's very, very different. It doesn't, there's nothing wrong with, with getting an office and, and having a staff report and working together as a cohesive team. I used to be that way. And mm -hmm. I was, maybe it was a decade ago, or maybe it was three decades ago. My life is different. I want to be able, if I want to go spend a month in Montana, I want to spend a month in Montana and have it not affect my business. And that's where I'm at in my life right now is I have parents in Florida that I want to visit all the time. And uh, I, uh, my daughter's in Arizona. I want to visit her all the time. Mm -hmm. I've already told my son he can't stay. So he's going to be someplace when he graduates and I want to visit him. And my roots will always be in Michigan. And then, 
And I would suspect that we'll have some kind of presence here um, for, for many, many years to come. But I just want freedom. I want freedom for travel. I want freedom from expense. I want freedom from mortgages. I want freedom from rent. I want freedom from payroll. Hmm. And um, so you just, it's not the same for everybody. That's what fits me. Maybe people aren't comfortable in that kind of environment. Or hmm. you know what, if you're if you're married with brothers and sisters and parents and kids that are in grade school, maybe my life doesn't fit for yours just hmm. yet. Maybe that's something you'd want in 15 years. But, um, you know, I have I have lived in Michigan all my life. I, it's my favorite state. It will always be my favorite state. I don't love our weather half the year, but it is what it is. Not everything is perfect, but I can have the best of all worlds as long as you plan for it and say, this is what I want. And and Leah and I are in unison on that, that we don't want to spend 12 months a year in Michigan, but we can't have it hurt our businesses either. Right. You know, we. Um, you know, we live a good life, but I can't just up and say I'm retiring and, and I don't want to. I really love helping small business owners get these dollars. It really brings me a lot of joy, but uh, it also is awfully nice to be able to do that from any state in the union. I can do mm -hmm. it from a plane. I can do it from anywhere. And and so can Leah. And so that's, that's what my goals are over the next uh, 10 years or so is to have a business that I can do from anywhere. Um, because honestly, I mean, if I had all the money in the world, I, I wouldn't be idle anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that sounds like a miserable way to finish life is to be idle and to not have purpose and to not be, uh, accomplishing something, helping people, mm -hmm. uh, loving your kids, loving your parents and, and that sort of thing. It's, uh, retirement is really overrated. I think we're going through a great reimagination of uh america and american life i mean it, and if you think about going back to uh post the u.s civil war um 1865 uh, you know we, we had this movement and we went from an agrarian kind of work economy in the u.s to a predominantly you know this industrial revolution that we went through and and work started for like maybe four maybe five generations work started to look an awful lot uh similar uh, from, you know, generation to generation, uh, coalescing around, you know, big manufacturing hubs, you know, uh, office buildings in downtown metro centers that were growing up and, you know, and, you know, congregating people into this, this work environment. If you really take a look at like our, our school system, our school system has literally uh, grown up to create an American worker who would come in, punch the clock, you know, eight to five, nine to five, follow orders, you know, listen to the whistle. And it, it feels like all of this it has like the, the reset button got hit during COVID. And you have a lot of young people who are like, hold on a second. Uh, I've been just as productive, if not more productive, working from home. And we've got technology now. And you know what? We, 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 we've, we went from the great resignation, okay, to quiet quitting. And I think we're moving into like a third kind of period where it, it is uh, the great reimagination of, well, I'm going to reimagine how I want to live life on my terms. I want to re I want to reimagine what work life balance and what work looks like for me. I, maybe I want to engineer my life to be completely different. I don't want to work at a law firm uh, in downtown Nashville or at an automotive facility in, you know, Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, I want to be like Jeff Wayne. I want to. I want to have a mobile business where I can do it wherever I want, wh as long as I have a high speed internet connection, and I can be down in the British Virgin Islands this week, and I could be in the south of France next month, and I could be, you know, in Timbuktu whenever, and I just, what's that? Top of the mountain, right? As long as you right, and it's just like, uh, and you're seeing it all around us. I, and I think it's this, the a millennial generation uh, and Gen Z who are really, like, like I was talking to Tris yesterday and she was, um, she's involved in, she has multiple entrepreneurial pursuits going on, very similar to your daughter, Maddie. And, you know, she was talking a little bit about the stresses of it. She's like, oh, everybody else in my, you know, she's in a fellowship in Nashville and they, they've got more of this normal lifestyle and, 
and I, I'm balancing all these various different things. I said, trust, trust me, <laughs> you, it may feel like you're a little bit overwhelmed right now, but in a few months when their fellowship ends, they're all going to be looking for a nine to five job. And you will have, you've got three different business opportunities in front of you that you will literally be able to move anywhere in the world and continue to do extremely well with. They're going to wish they were in your shoes. It's just, I, I, I'm, it, it excites me to see how we are maybe redesigning a little bit of society around us. And I love the words of wisdom that you had there, Jeff, of like, don't measure yourself. If someone's listening, whether mid-career professional or maybe a young person, don't measure yourself on this benchmark of what success used to be like for your grandparents or your parents because today you have the opportunity to reimagine everything and to design something that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, earlier you mentioned uh, chat GPT and I honestly, I didn't know what that was 45 days ago. And I talked to my son who's up in East Lansing uh, every day. Mm -hmm. He had text normally, but um, eh, phone calls too. And he has brought up chat GPT. 10 times. And every time he talks, he's more shocked by it, more amazed by it, more impressed by it. And I recently sent him an article uh, about that Microsoft is now committed another $10 billion. Mm -hmm. That's with a B to, uh, you know, they're a partner uh, for the artificial uh, intelligent part of chat uh, GPT. And he, when I sent that to him, he said, it, it's blown my mind even more what I'm reading about it now. I mean, he's talking about how it's recently passed the bar. They just literally fed the bar questions into chat B, uh, GPT and it passed the bar and it's writing essays. And um, he says, that Michael, my son, views it like there's just nothing you can ask it that it doesn't know the answer to. It can write a screenplay. It writes poetry, right? I mean, th this is a Google killer if you think about it, right? I mean, Google should be quaking in its boots right now because their entire business model is based on advertising where you go to a computer, you type in what you're looking for, and then there's marketing ads all around it. And chat, chat GPT, if with the app on my phone or here, it's going to go oral, right? It's, it's, it, you're literally going to walk around with your Apple headset in and be like, you know, give me the answer to this. Give me the answer to that. There's no advertising based around it. Um, G Google, Google's business, because uh, Microsoft said, hey, we're going to in, in, uh, put this into our Bing search engine. We're going to bake it hardwired into Microsoft Word. Um, our My Microsoft Office 365, I mean, G Google could get upended in a New York minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's incredible to see where this goes. I remember when uh, Jeff Bezos was uh, at his at the top of the hill uh, with with Amazon, and it was around that time when someone was he had become the richest man in America or the richest man in the world. And somebody had asked Bill Gates, maybe Bill Gates got passed by him or something like that. And they'd asked him uh, who, what he thought about that and what he thought about the world's first trillionaire. And Bill Gates said, I don't know who the first, the world's first trillionaire will be, but I'll tell you where he's going to come from. And it's going to be AI. And Bill said that three or four years ago, he said, mm -hmm. we will have a trillionaire who is behind AI. And uh, so artificial intelligence is, is certainly um, still in its infancy stage. Um, there's a lot of scary, scary things with that. I mean, one of the things that my son Michael told me was, yeah, this thing can write a paper and is so intelligent that it knows when it writes it not to plagiarize. And so, of course, the uh, the pessimistic side of my brain is like, well, so I hate to see kids cheat on papers mm -hmm. because they know they can't be caught because this is so smart that not even a professor can tell that it was plagiarized. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you still have to know the math. And even if even if uh, AI shows you the steps in which you had to solve the math problem, you still better be able to replicate that when you're actually taking a test. Right. But, you know, I guess with anything, there can be good and bad coming out of it. And how is it going to get used? And there certainly will be nefarious ways to to use anything in this world. And 
but I'm excited to see where AI goes. I, I, it's, it's something that is, it's like the universe. You just can't comprehend at this stage in our lives, some of the things that it can do and what it might bring good and bad. Right. Well, my, uh, one of the companies that Tris is working with is a, uh, AI technology company, um, early stage, and they use uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT on some of the back end stuff that they're that they're working on. And so, you know, I just told her it's like go deep in this, get get involved. That you you're, you're in the the process of hitting a home run. This is fantastic. But the other thing that I uh, will share with my kids, and I mean, just yesterday I was out. Um, there's a, a young guy uh, at my church that uh, is going, you know, starting his. Um, uh, an engineering program at UT. And so I'm kind of mentoring him a little bit and uh, just having lunch with them. And I was just saying, look, you know, it, in the in the past, it was really important to have deep, deep, deep domain uh, experience and expertise in various career fields. And, you know, it, once we started having the wisdom of you know, King Solomon in our hands with our, you know, I'm holding up an Apple iPhone. I mean, I literally have the world's wisdom, you know, at my fingertips, the, the ability or the need for me to memorize all sorts of theorems and formulas and facts and so forth. I don't really need that anymore. I can literally just ask Google or check whatever, and I get any information that I need at a moment's notice. But in, in the context, when the world started flipping, I think it became more and more important for people to have not just deep domain expertise, but actually breadth. All of a sudden, having breadth of experience where you have been able to experience the world in a multitude of areas, where you've been able to travel, where you have relationships, and you're able to, when people who are able to connect the dots, because now you've got the world's wisdom at your fingertips, but if you don't know what to do with it, it's your base. It's basically useless. And the people who are going to make a fortune, the people who are going to be able to leverage all this new technology, are people who have a breadth of experience and are able to be insightful and say, "Okay, how am I going to connect these dots? How do I take all these disparate pieces of information, uh, put it together in a mosaic uh, for something useful?" So I, I'm still. I probably. I'm not dystopian when I look at. Um, some of the advancements of technology, I, I still probably tend to skew optimist on. You just have to place yourself at that and those right intersections, right? I mean, just like your dad did, right? Your your dad's a classic example. You know, as 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 much as the world changes, some things stay the same. And your dad could have had a dystopian viewpoint of what happened to him in that office all those many years ago. When, uh, you know, his CEO, his boss was pulling him aside. It's like, you know what? I see the opportunity here. I see how I can go out and I can connect all these pieces of information, put myself in the middle of it and create value for customers, create a world-class company. Um, I think You're those- right. You can cut a student disappointment and anger and mm -hmm. then you show up every day in that environment or you say, well- Maybe there's something else out there for me. Um, you know, you and I were talking about before about, uh, you know, what our, what our kids are being taught. I mean, think about what they're being taught today compared to what we were being taught in high school and in college. And I mean, I didn't even know this. I, I just learned the other day, maybe it's because I'm 56 now, but I didn't even realize that effective about four or five years ago, they stopped teaching cursive writing in school. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm just so, I mean, there's so many things that I just must not know anything about. And then I look, I think about it and I, and I, and I say to myself, I don't write very often. I type a lot. Mm -hmm. I read a ton. I read a lot every day. It's usually on a laptop or my phone, but I, if I write a page, my hand is tired. That's how long it's been since I have used cursive writing. And I mean, I, I asked my uh, daughter the other day uh, about a check or something. And she said, Dad, I don't own a checkbook. I've never written. A, she's 26 years old. She's never written a check. And so, you know, I, I don't think uh, you're talking about uh, dystopian environment. I don't think you can be an entrepreneur and a dystopian. I don't think you can. I think that's that's, if that's you insightful. Have, if you don't have optimism, why yeah. would you ever start a company? That's yeah. like saying... I'm going to go climb Kilimanjaro, but I don't think I can make it. Yeah. Well, guess what? You're not. You're not. You never will. Nope.
Well, man, I thought we have covered a lot of ground here. This is this has been a, a phenomenal conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I've uh, been uh, motivated and inspired once again by you. Every single time I get on a phone call with you, it's uh, I find it encouraging. Uh, I certainly enjoy reminiscing about the past and uh, certainly look forward to the next time you and I can go out there and, and climb a, a 14er together. So we, we got to do it. Hopefully, maybe this summer we'll, we'll find a, an excuse to find ourselves in Colorado with, uh, with some of our kids and, or some friends, and we'll do another great adventure. Um, and one of the two closing questions that I have for people that are on the, on the show are, are you currently reading anything or have you read anything in the last year that you've said, man, this has been a phenomenal book. This has really been eye opening or helpful or encouraging. Uh, any, any books that you would recommend for folks? You know, I, I honestly, most of my reading is, is online in turn. It's usually entrepreneur related or political related so that, you know, I know, I know what's going on in the world almost everywhere in almost every corner of the world. I, I know enough to be dangerous and, and that takes up as much of my time. I, I would say probably the most classic book that I have ever read that never leaves me and its principles never leave me are good to great. And, yeah. um, and the good to great book for me, one of the most important things is uh, the chapter about selling the mills. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and the, the purpose of that chapter was to say, sometimes it's time, sometimes it's time to dump what you thought was a core part of your business, or a core part of your life, uh, especially in life. I mean, maybe there's that, that one person that is just never positive. Mm -hmm. that that person just always got the bad vibes i mean mm -hmm. if there's a person who you always leave and you're never in a better mood than when you found them it might not be the person that you want to be spending a lot of time with and even if it's family mm -hmm. and a lot of times it is and so we're only on this this globe for a speck of time and it doesn't make sense to spend time on stuff that's bringing you down bringing your business down, uh, bringing your mojo down, bringing your entrepreneurial spirit down. And, uh, and so I just, I think about the chapters in that book a lot and how, if you, if you, if, if your if your relationships are good and your business is good and you feel like your life is good, is that what you want on your tombstone or do you want to be great? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Callie, you know, so. good is, uh, good is, good is on the way down to bad. And so yeah. <laughs> as, it, as it says in the book, good is the enemy of great. Yep. And so just strive in all aspects of your life to be great. That's, that's uh, great words of encouragement. Um, final question. If, if you had the ability, uh, if the president of the United States asked you to give a state of the union address, a keynote address to the American people, what would you say? You know, I really don't want to be political here. You can do, you can be whatever you want. It doesn't have to be political. It could just be a word of encouragement. But if you've got something on your, you know, what, what would you say? I mean, you've, uh, uh, President Biden has given you the microphone. Jeff Wayne, I want you to address the American people. They we're going through a challenge. We're going through hardships. We got, you know, people, there's uncertainty, what, you know, in, inspire the American people to the, be the best versions of themselves or, or, or I don't know, what is it? What would you, what would you say? Honestly, Bob, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of, uh, of notes that I prepared and things that I thought we might talk about today. And I think it would be a lot of this stuff. I think it would be a year from now, how different do you want your life to be? And what do you need to do today? What are the first things that need to happen for you to be in a better spot a year from now, whether that be a better marriage a better relationship with your kids, a better relationship with your coworkers or your boss or your brothers or your sisters. Um, you, you know, if, if you, you'll find that if you do a little work in charities, you're mm -hmm. going to feel a lot better about yourself. You're going to feel like you're, you know, you're part of the quilt that's being knitted by Americans. Mm -hmm. And, and we all need to do more of that. You need to, you know, there needs to be me time. There needs to be, you know, 45 minutes a day or every other day of just time uh, that you're thinking about 
where, where do you want to be? I mean, maybe it could be on a run. Maybe it could be in a spin class at cycle bar. Maybe it could, it could be just a walk in your neighborhood or in your own living room, just thinking about what, what brings me down and what lifts me up and concentrate more on the, on the parts of your life that, that lift you up and, and decide what is really, really important to me. I mean, I know in YPO, Bob, you and I uh, have both been through this process, but it's, you know, a question of like, what do you want to hear at your, your own funeral? Mm -hmm. And what could be more important than that? If you had your, uh, you know, God forbid you don't outlive your parents or your brothers or your best friends, um, what would you want to hear from them? Mm -hmm. And uh, would you today, would you be satisfied with what you heard at your own funeral? Um, I don't know that anybody would really be truly satisfied uh, until until you're satisfied with your own life. I mean, if you're really, really happy at work, happy with your marriage, happy with your personal relationships, happy with the amount of money that you're making, happy with the time that you give to other people and charities and things of that nature. I think that's what we all strive for. And I think it just comes down to what is your what is your life resume looking like today? And how are you going to change that in the next year? How are you going to change that in the next six months? But yeah. just don't feel like you're just stuck and you have no options because that's just not the case. There are there are more options in this country than any other country on the planet. That's for sure. Absolutely. You know, I, I've heard you know your advice about trying to find happiness and, and move away from the, those unhappy moments or things in your life, it, it really resonates with me because I, I recently heard someone say uh, not to worry about whether people like you or dislike you because most people don't even like themselves. And there's, I, I do think that there are a lot of folks in life that are, they, they find themselves in unhappy situations uh, and many times they're unhappy with themselves. Uh, maybe they they obsess about you know issues in the past, or I wish I would have done this differently. I wish I mean I would have made a different decision here. I wish I could. You, you can't change the past, but they end up spending um, their entire life uh, running from themselves. Uh, and another quote I recently heard was that you will uh, you will run the farthest and the fastest when you are trying to run from yourself. And, you know, the, the only way to, to stop that is to, you know, look in the mirror, accept responsibility, ask tough questions, uh, and make changes. And I think that, you know, you're, what you've just highlighted and what you just said was, you know, basically that it's just like, look, you know, accept responsibility, make changes. And there's, um, it's never too late. It's never too late to make a change in your life that will put you on a new uh, career trajectory or life trajectory where you can be the best version of you, live the best version of your life. You can make a difference and, and find happiness. I couldn't agree more, my friend, and I uh, can't wait to see you on the top of another mountain soon. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. I, look, is there anything that you have there in your notes I, yeah, um, that you wanted to share uh, that we didn't get to? I, I don't want to cut you short if there's something that you prepared or a story or a theme or, you know, something that you wanted to get out there. Anything, anything. Well, I just saw on, I just saw on Facebook that our Killy climb was 13 years ago this week. Oh my gosh. 13 years ago. 13 Seems like years ago. So I was yeah. 43 years old and, uh, and I, I, I would like to do it again. I mean, Everest base camp has always been my, my bucket list trip, my bucket list mm -hmm. climb. Uh, I have no intentions of entering the death zone. I have no intentions of going higher than base camp. Um, but uh, I'll do Everest. Just not sure when. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, that'll that give me something. Let's put a, a circle it on the calendar, you know, something to, sh to shoot for. I've, I've had an, uh, multiple friends who have uh, gone there and, and done that. And, you know, it's a life-changing experience. I've got, there's a... Uh, I'll introduce you uh, to this gentleman. I won't mention his name here. He was a uh, former uh, Army Green Beret and um, actually, I'm sorry, Delta Force, Ar Army Delta Forces, and then went into the CIA. So he's Special Forces, but he's a YPOer. And he and a group of Special Forces guys did one of the very first high altitude jumps uh, over Everest uh, and landed in a drop zone there. Kind of like Everest Base Camp or something. It was it was it was epic, 
And um, I just recently saw some videos of it and he was just talking it up and I was like, you know what, Jeff and I, we talked about doing this way back in the day. I'm not getting any younger. We need to go do it. So let's, let's hustle up Gary and a couple other ad- adventurous souls and, you know, go spend some quiet time on the side of a mountain, have a, a spiritual moment uh, and enjoy each other's camaraderie and, and do something that's unique and distinctive once again. Yeah. And it, you know, it's again, like anything in life, whether or not you're climbing a mountain or building a relationship or running a business, you've got to have a plan. And I know that I could get to base camp at Everest, but mm-hmm. I also am smart enough to know I couldn't do it today mm-hmm. that I just, I need some time in front of me. And man, there is no greater motivator than a deadline. Oh my and God. there's no greater motivator than knowing you know, your, your kids are going to college and you better plan for that. You, you're going to the top of Everest and you better plan for that. And you're getting married, you're starting this business where the rent's going to start being due. And I got to hire people. We're going to open, you know, two Tuesdays from now. What, what greater motivator is there than the deadline of something? And I have found when I get really, really lazy from an exercise point of view, Mm-hmm. All I need to do is throw a mountain on my list. And I have I have been on a mountain unprepared and it will never happen again. And it's my own doing. And, you know, you put something as monstrous as Everest Base Camp on your list. And, uh, you know, you buy those tickets so there's no turning back. Yeah. And the clock began. The, the, I'll start counting miles. I'll start tracking weight. You start doing everything, but if you just talk about it, then you're just going to binge TV with your wife and Mm. um, skip the gym. And it's, man, you got to set some goals. You got to set some deadlines and you got to have something to look forward to in front of you. Uh, You could not have ended on a better note for this year. Setting that, yeah, set that deadline people, (laughs) right? It is having... Yes, you got to. Absolutely. Otherwise, you just sit there and you talk about it, talk about it. You'll talk about it to the day you die and nothing will get done. Right. I think there is a fame. There's a famous uh, uh, poem my dad used to recite about the um, victory uh, was snatched by defeat on the plains of hesitation. I'll have to think. uh, I'll I'll put it in the show notes what the poem is, but it's about the plains of hesitation. And basically, victory was snatched by defeat because people waiting and in waiting they died and um so yeah, and you, you know what's you know the only thing harder than me climbing um uh, everest base camp when i'm 56 climbing it when i'm 57 that's right <laughs> and so let's uh you know you're right i mean we we climbed together uh 13 years ago and i promise you it was a lot easier then than our next climb will be wherever that might be so uh, let's set those goals and uh, let's check those bucket list items. Well, I'm looking forward to it, buddy. Thank you for uh, spending time with us today. I'll make sure to get all the all these links in our show notes. And uh, I love you, brother. You've been a a, a great friend, um, motivator, and inspire. And it's been great spending a little bit of time with you this afternoon. You as well, Bob. I look forward to it. Yeah, thanks, buddy. See you, bye. Today's episode was engineered by Mitch White with graphic and marketing by Tristan Dickey. Special thanks to our guest, Jeff Wayne, for taking the time to be with us. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or wherever you go to listen to great pods. If you like the show, please share it with a friend and give us a review. That is always appreciated. Thank you for spending time with us today, and we'll be back next week with more.